this time we have the opportunity to come to our good, good Father in prayer. So I'd ask you, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, as the song has said, you are a good, good Father. And all of that word, that that word goodness means. Thank you for your kindness and your love to your children. Thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to correct us in love and to discipline us. Thank you that as our Heavenly Father, you always have time for us. And thank you that you have a listening ear to what is in our hearts and our, our requests to you. Thank you that we can call on you at any time. We never wake you up from sleep because you never slumber nor sleep. We thank you that you are always there, always there. And we thank you, Father, for continually reminding us of your love. We thank you that you are the perfect provider, that you give and send every good and perfect gift from heaven. We thank you, Lord, that you fill our hands with meaningful work and that you take pleasure in your people. Thank you for that. Lord, and we thank you that that pleasure is continuous, though at times we um, disappoint you. Often we disappoint you. Often, Lord, um, we bring your displeasure by our sins and by our disobedience. And yet, there you are, ready and willing to forgive and to receive back. We pray, Father, and thank you and bless you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us who are fathers and spiritual fathers and future fathers to reflect you more and more in the ways that we, that we parent, Lord, and the ways that we are as parents to children who either have no father or their father is, a, is an absent one or worse. We pray you would forgive our many failings. They are many. And we pray that you will help those who've been wounded by fathers, those who bear scars when the family shepherd became a wolf or a badger. We pray that you'll be with those for whom this is a hard day and not a happy day. And those who are grieving um, with empty arms, in one way or another. Lord, you know all our hearts, you know all our situations, and, and it's just like you to know. It's who you are. You know our feelings, you know our thoughts, you know the words that we're about to speak before ever we form them. You are our God and our Heavenly Father. We pray that you will help us who are children to honor our parents and the Lord and especially those who are of a minor age, help our children to know you, to grow in Christ, to trust in you. And we think, Heavenly Father, how in this world there are ever so many people that have no spiritual father, but they're lost. The devil is their father. And we thank you that you have not turned your back on them, but that you are ever out calling, sending your servants out, calling to come home to you, to trust in your son, to be reconciled to you through Christ. We pray that you will continue to keep calling wandering sinners, lost sinners, back to yourself through the work of the Gideons, through the work of the Bible League, through the work of Open Door Mission and other outreaches, but also, Lord, through our own lives and our own personal testimonies of your grace in our lives. Father, we pray for this. We pray that you will be with those who are convalescing from surgery, um, one from um, vascular procedure. Um, we pray that you will be with our cancer patients, Lord, and uh, in their dealing with their cancer, but also the other complications that come with that. We pray for healing mercy, Lord. Pray you'll be with those who've suffered strokes and are seeking to get back so much of what they lost, something of what they lost. And we thank you that in those cases that has been given, but Lord, we pray for a continued healing, please. We pray, Father, um, for one who is waiting for your upward call in Christ Jesus, that you'll be with her. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those in war-torn lands, 
that you would remember the refugee, the orphan, the widow, and uh, the fatherless, that you'll be with them, Lord, and that you will be near to them and that you will make it known that you are there. Father, you know every person on the face of this earth. You know where they are, you know what they're doing, you know what they're thinking, you know their needs. You are such a God. There's no one like you. You are holy. Father, we pray that you would bless the continued preparations for Vacation Bible School um, and that you would reach out through this ministry that children might know you and that those who do know you might be built up and strengthened. We pray your blessing upon the staff and all the preparations that need to be made. Um, And uh, just we give this into your hands. Lord, we pray you'll watch over those in pro-life ministry and those whom they serve, as well as the, uh, the physical buildings and um, machinery and tools that's involved in supporting those ministries. We pray your watch, care, and protection. And we pray, too, Lord, that you will give justice, that justice may be done, Lord. Uh, Father, we give all these things into your hands. You have such big hands. You don't drop anything of what we put into them. And we thank you and we bless you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite your attention now to the book of Philemon in the New Testament. The book of Philemon. And we'll read that in just a moment. One thing I want to say, and this is coming from someone who knows what his feet taste like. Um, One communication lesson that's usually learned the hard way is watch your tone. When it comes to being heard, how we say something, including our tone, is often as important as what we say. If you want to be heard, we have to watch our tone. If we say something in the wrong tone, it hinders a person from being able to hear what's being said. God calls us as his people to to speak truth, but also to speak truth in a truthful way, which includes how we say something. And that's a challenge due to sin in our hearts. When we're saved, we still have that old sin nature trying to bring us down and also flaring up at the wrong times. We have that on the inside, but on the outside, we swim in a sea of culture that is screaming often. Screaming entitlements, angry tones, screaming messages, and some scream even louder by violence and by vandalism. We have all that around us as we swim in that water, if you will. And I just want to say that, you know, our Lord never spoke that way. And we certainly are not supposed to speak that way. And the Apostle Paul, in this letter to Philemon, never spoke that way either. And I'm bringing this letter to you, um, Paul's letter to this man Philemon, his Christian friend, because it exemplifies Christian tact and diplomacy. It exemplifies a right tone. As Christ's royal ambassador, the Apostle Paul could have demanded this man, Philemon, give him what he, Paul, wanted or required to comply. But instead, by gentle reasoning with this man, Philemon, Paul sought to persuade him to grant his request that Philemon would be on board willingly with what Paul was asking. And as we read this letter, I want you to listen for the loving friendly tone that Paul uses. It, it really does exemplify Christian diplomacy and tact. So we, we have Philemon. It's Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. 
And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that by your goodness, but that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he part, was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your own owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And may God add his blessing to this, his holy word. We have this letter from Paul, and Paul is very tactful here, and his tact is a means to a godly end, and it's an end which reflects, really, the love of Christ. And here we have, then, as our theme, too, we have Christ's servant. He's pleading a runaway rebel's cause. Christ's servant, Paul, he's pleading a runaway rebel's cause. And as we look over this text, I want you to notice a gracious intercession but also a gospel illustration, and then finally a goodly imitation. We're just going to begin with the occasion that brought Paul to write and ask for mercy on behalf of this slave whose name was Onesimus. He was a man who was doubly straying that Paul led to Christ. So you have a gracious intercession, and the backstory is this. Philemon this man who was Onesimus' master. Philemon was a wealthy man. He lived in Colossae, which is in southwestern Turkey. Um, Paul led this man Philemon to faith in Christ. He brought, led him to the Savior, and Philemon from then on generously supported the Lord's work, including loaning his home to the church as a place to meet. He owned at least one slave, Onesimus, now, I know some people say, well, wait a minute, he's owning a slave? How is that for Christians? That was not considered wrong in that culture. He owned at least one slave, Onesimus, and Onesimus ran away from his master. He ran away uh, and possibly stole some valuables from his master as well. And he ran away to Rome, and that's at least 1,300 miles away. Who was going to look for him in that gigantic city of Rome? Slave catchers probably aren't going to find him there. But God did. Providentially, Onesimus met the Apostle Paul in a Roman prison. Paul was a prisoner, and Paul led him to freedom by faith in Christ Jesus. And how ironic that Onesimus comes to Paul, who leads him to Christ, and Paul just happens to know Onesimus' master, 1,300 miles back home. You can try to run from God, 
but it doesn't work. Wherever you go, he's already there waiting for you. Kind of reminds me of when we were kids. I think it was my dad that told me, you might be able to outrun a police car, but you're not going to be able to outrun a police radio, which is true. Not that I ever tried. I never had anything that could do that. But I, just to get back to the point, you can run from God, you can try to hide, but wherever you're trying to hide, he's already there. And you can abet that when Onesimus told his salvation story, he had quite a salvation story to tell about how God, God found him. So you have this new convert, this slave, Onesimus, and he's caring for this prisoner, the Apostle Paul, his earthly needs, ran his errands. You have to remember, prisons back then were not like prisons today, where you get three hots and a cot and all of that sort of thing, TV and so forth. Back then, if you didn't have friends on the outside bringing food into you and other creature comforts or needs, you were really not doing well. So you have this slave, saved person, waiting on Paul, and Paul so appreciated the help and as spiritual father and son, Paul and Onesimus got very, very close. But Paul also knew that this runaway had to complete his repentance. And that is by confessing his rebellion and by asking for his master's forgiveness. And so Paul writes to Philemon, the slave owner, and he pleads with Philemon, as we've just read, to show mercy, to show forgiveness. And I just have you note that Paul's tact, his diplomacy, did not blunt the power of his gracious intercession. In fact, it made it stronger. And Paul gave some reasons why Philemon should forgive and receive Onesimus, this prodigal slave. First of all, Paul, um, he requested that Philemon would sacrifice his indignation for Christ's sake. It, it comes from Paul who's in prison for the sake of Christ. Paul was no stranger to sacrifice in the service of the Lord. Here he's in prison serving the Lord and because he was serving the Lord. And so he's writing to this man to sacrifice his indignation and forgive. And, and Paul isn't just writing as a private person either. Remember that he's an apostle, an ambassador of Christ. So this is sort of an official form or communique from the kingdom of heaven, um, from call, Paul, uh, Christ's representative. So Christ is making his appeal through Paul. That's one thing. But another thing is how, and Paul kind of takes this up. He says, how, how could Philemon refuse to receive as a Christian brother one who was Paul's spiritual son in the Lord? Someone who had shown his Christianity by caring for Paul's needs. And, and so forth. Someone that was so dear to Paul and, you know, Christ died for Philemon, but he also died for Onesimus. How could Onesimus refuse this to forgive and to receive him? And there's a related text to this that kind of adds in what Paul is saying, where Jesus says to the sheep on his right hand in the sheep and the goats parable in Matthew 25, where he says to the sheep at his right hand, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. There is this powerful appeal Paul makes by giving reasons for why Onesimus should, um, should welcome and forgive the slave. And yet Paul goes on and he points out the advantage to Philemon to receive the former prodigal as a now Christian slave and brother, Onesimus is going to be heart and soul loyal to his master for the sake of Jesus. And in this, Paul plays a word game with the name Onesimus, which means useful. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. The apostle also goes on to suggest that perhaps one of the Lord's purposes for Onesimus' escape was for his subsequent conversion, but also that Philemon might have him back forever. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, 
that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul gave some other reasons too, but they all converge and lead to this great therefore, or the so, in verse 17, so, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Before we go on with that, I just want to make some applications. Again, just have you note Paul's tact, his diplomacy. In, in his reasoning with Philemon. He doesn't need to scream. He doesn't need to threaten. Um, and through Paul, it's Christ wooing Philemon to show mercy to this slave. He is, he, Christ is wooing Philemon to forego his right to punishment and revenge. And then even verses 18 and 19, you have Paul offering to make restitution on, on Onesimus' behalf. Um, First of all, for the, the labors of the slave that Philemon lost when he was run away, but also perhaps for something that he may have taken. So you have that. Um, and I guess you think about it. Do you, do you hear how powerful this persuasion is? I'll cover for him. I'll make good for him. Just forgive him and receive him back. Do you think it would be a tenth as powerful? If Paul had screamed at Philemon that it was, you know, his right to demand him to be kind to this slave. I also would have you notice something else here, and this is of practical use for us when we have to have a difficult conversation with someone. This is a letter. Now, understand, Paul couldn't travel to Philemon to ask you know, please forgive this guy. It's 1,300 miles away. But that said, even when face-to-face, -face, there are times when a letter helps us to discuss or communicate hard things with another person. Before we launch our words, and they're always launched in a tone, before we launch our words and the tone of them with a letter, we have opportunity to review. We have opportunity to take a second listen and a third, and sometimes to ask someone we trust to read it and say, what do you hear? Is this, you know, how is this, do you hear this? And then we can read it to the person right in their presence, if need be, and hand it over to them. When you're doing that, you're not being a chicken. You're right there in front of them giving them the letter or reading them the letter and handing them the letter. It's not like you're behind a bunker somewhere, a safe place, and sending the letter. You're right there in front of them. And I think that's more powerful. When, so I just commend that to you. If you have to have a hard discussion with someone, and if you're like me, you get all tangled up when you're all nervous with your words or upset, a letter can be a better route to go. The other thing I would have you notice is that Christian minds persuade by giving reasons, by making a case, not just by screaming, not by screaming or demanding, but Christian minds seek to persuade. And when we're reasoning with believers, assuming that we are seeking what the Lord wants and what is their best, um, we try to show them how what we're asking them to do or asking them to give is a way of loving and serving God and loving and serving others. If we are reasoning with unbelievers, we seek to try to persuade them by showing them, again, how the case we're trying to make is a way of, of loving their neighbor as themselves and how it benefits them, this person we're trying to persuade. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to win the person's agreement. Um, people still disagree um, with, you know, a well-argued case because they have personal preferences. Um, and, and you see this, I'll give you an example. When people argue from scripture and from history and experience and from statistics, 
that the traditional family unit is the best way for raising children. It's the best. You can, you can argue that and argue from scripture, history, tradition, and so forth, and the case, they still say, well, I don't care, that's not the way I'm going to go. Whether heard or not heard, we do need to make the case for what God instituted. Christian minds persuade by making, giving reasons, good reasons. So you have, I'm going back now, Christ's servant, the Apostle Paul, he's pleading a runaway rebel slave's case with the master, his master. This is a gracious intercession, but it also looks beyond that occasion and gives us a wonderful gospel illustration. Paul's pleading for Onesimus reflects Christ's intercession for us with the Father. Have you considered that every saved sinner is an Onesimus? You, if you're a Christian, you're an Onesimus. I am an Onesimus. That is to say, we are a person whom God's grace brought in contact with hearers of the Apostles' message. And through the good news of God's grace in Christ Jesus, he worked in us a desire to come home to our Master and to stop running and to stop looking over our shoulders and to come and repent of our sins and trust in the Savior. He brought us to see our sin and our rebellion, but also to see that Christ is the way home. That's something that if you are a Christian, you are, if you will, you are a converted Onesimus. And this is our experience down here on earth, what the Lord has done through sending people to bring us, uh, to lead us to Christ. But then there's also a heavenward side to this. And that is, just like Paul pleading with Philemon for Onesimus' forgiveness, we have a Savior who stands at the Father right, Father's right hand. He is our great high priest, and he pleads for us. He pleads for us and for our um, acceptance and reception um, and welcome of the Father. Whether we have just come to salvation through faith in Christ or whether we have stumbled and fallen as Christians and are in fresh need of forgiveness, there is the Lord Jesus standing there before the Father pleading for us by name, pleading for our forgiveness, pleading for whatever grace or help we have in time of need. And we have all our need times, our times of need. And just like Paul pleading for Onesimus, our Lord Jesus doesn't plead any worthiness on our part. He doesn't say, oh, you should forgive them. They're such nice people. No, what does he plead? He pleads his own worth. He pleads his own worth as the Son of God, but also as the one who is the sinless man who gave himself for us. He pleads his finished work on the cross. He pleads its saving application to his people. Paul's word, verse 17 here, really reflects what Jesus is asking God on our behalf. If you consider me a, a, your, to be your partner, receive him, receive her, as you would me, as you've received me. That's the only way, by the way, that a holy God could ever grant us sinners his gracious blessings and benefits. It can only be for Jesus' sake. And the thing I'd also have us consider is that God will never reject his son's prayers. He will never reject his son's prayers and particularly his son's prayers on behalf of his people. Sometimes we get all tangled up in things, we sin and you know, our conscience is bothering us and the devil piles on and all this and that. I hope that the Lord will bring to remembrance that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation that is the covering for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And not only is he the covering, but he's the covering that speaks with the Father on our behalf. 
he will receive us by grace as he has received his own son. Now, if you are someone here this morning who is not saved, not a believer in Christ, you don't have a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have a spiritual relationship or connection with him, I ask you to hear God's offer, a well-meant offer to you, not trying to sell you anything. God isn't trying to sell you anything. He has a gift for you, and he means it well as a gift. Outside of Christ, those who have no relationship with Jesus Christ, Everyone is a sinner and everyone is an unsaved Onesimus, if you will, in the sense that every one of us, if we're not saved, if we're outside of Christ, we are runaways. We are rebels against the God who created us, who created us for himself. He is our owner. He is also our master. He created us for himself. And if we are not believers in Christ, if we are outside of Christ, we are those who are in rebellion against him as sinners. We've, we've broken his law. We've also stolen from him. We've taken things that he uh, has given or offers and used them for our own sinful way. And by our own sins and by our own ingratitude, we have burned our bridges to God. We have alienated ourselves from him. And you, it's a bridge that we can't rebuild to get back across to God. In fact, what's happened is each one of our sins and the sins of our forefathers have dug this giant canyon, this gigantic crevasse, if you will, separating us from God. And there's no way we can bridge that. Every unbeliever is like runaway, lost Onesimus, far from home. But in his love, God sends a servant to show the way home to God. Paul showed Onesimus the Jesus bridge that was built by Jesus' sin sacrifice on the cross. This runaway slave, Onesimus, he believed God's offer. He believed that God meant it, this offer to forgive sin, and he trusted God for that. He was trusting that God was calling him to come home, to come across that Jesus bridge, to come home and be reconciled through faith in Christ. And today God has sent another servant to you to show you that super safe bridge, the only Savior that God gave Jesus Christ. And it's through this message that you're being called. God stands on the other side of the chasm on the other side of the canyon, and he warmly calls to you through this text, through my voice, he warmly calls to you to come home to him. To come home. And the way home is first of all admitting that you are estranged, admitting it to yourself, but also to him that you have sinned and that you are uh, estranged from God and actually have been in rebellion against him. You've been running away from him. Come home by by acknowledging that, but also trusting yourself to Jesus' death to cover all your sins. And if you are one who's used to doing things your own way, and you're the handyman or handywoman type, you can fix it, I can do this, it's hard because it means that we have to sacrifice our pride and humble ourselves. But there's no way back except the fix that God has made in his son. And the way home is by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting yourself to him and to what he did on the cross, giving himself up as a sacrifice for others' sins, but also for yours. And believing also that God wants you back. I don't know how it was with you as children, but there are times when I was a naughty boy. I know you you have no trouble believing that. And I didn't think my folks wanted me back because I was naughty. And of course they did. 
I was probably going to get paddled, but they wanted me back. And part of the thing of coming home to Christ is really believing deep down in your heart that God wants you back, but he tells us that he wants you back. And he even sent his son to the death of the cross to bring you back. That's pretty much loudly saying, I want you back. He wants to receive you. He wants to welcome you. And if you rest your entire faith on Christ to save you, if you tell God your sins and ask him to forgive you for the sake of what Jesus did, God will receive you back, just like he received his own son, Jesus Christ. That's how safe and secure are the runaways, the runaway who comes home to God by Jesus Christ. We have this gospel illustration here. And we have this gracious intercession that Paul made for this slave Onesimus. Now I would have you consider a a closing with a a goodly imitation. This is more of an application. But it's this, that for the sake of the gospel and in the service of Christ's kingdom, Paul asks gospel partner Philemon to take to himself Paul's other gospel partner, Onesimus, verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Application. Even though our transition circumstances differ from Philemon's, in the Lord's name, your old pastor asks you to receive Jake and Samantha and family as you have taken my wife, my family, and myself to yourselves, that you would receive them in the same way as you have so graciously received us over these three decades, that you would show them that same constant, patient, loving hospitality, that gracious encouragement that you've shown us over these many years. And you know, at times, that's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy for us as a church, maybe not as individuals, because we've done things a certain way for 30 years. You've had the same face in the pulpit that long, and so on and so forth. The buses come from a somewhat different church culture. Um, They're young and they're eager. They're full of ideas about how to do biblical ministry. And some of those ideas will stretch us, uncomfortably so. That said, may our gracious Lord help us to receive Jake, Samantha, and family in the same way as you have received us folks. It will glorify him. It will help build his church. And it will also help gather other Onesimuses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful letter that you inspired Paul to write and for the things that you show us in it. And we thank you for your heart, Heavenly Father, that that Paul was reflecting and asking Philemon to reflect. Thank you that you are great and greatly to be praised and that you are merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, and that you call, you call, you call, and we thank you for that gracious call in Christ. Please, if there is someone among us or some ones among us who don't know your saving grace, who don't know you, Lord Jesus, from the inside out, that you would draw them with the cords of love, even as you've drawn others of us, and that they would know what it is to know the Lord and the love of the Lord. And uh, we pray for this. We pray you'll bless the word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.
riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always, now and now only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys. receive God's parting blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you forever. Amen.